Hey everyone, it's Dave, and today I'm working on the Sliver Queen here for the Token of the Month Club, available on my Patreon. And uh, I wanted to kind of like show you guys a little bit of my <clears throat> my process here as I as I go along. Um, we started off with a um, just a very simple sketch outline and uh, built it up and kind of gave it some life of its own and as we built up and got to where it's going this is where we're at at this moment <clears throat> but uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is kind of like some of the little processes that I do along the way maybe might help you out when you're doing your own work um, number one thing is I want to kind of talk a little bit about the uh, influence and how I got this idea um, first thing I did is I took a look at the original sliver queen uh, let me zoom in on that a little bit more. And uh, it's a really cool piece of classic Magic the Gathering artwork. And you can see here there's all sorts of different colors and it's very vibrant and very bold. And you get the sense of the, the cave that it's in. It has the, um, let me get the highlight here so we can see it a little bit. Uh, you get like the, the highlight from the, the, the cave that it's in. And it has like these very like um, alien H.R. Giger ribbed gothic kind of look to the uh to the chamber and then we have the sliver queen itself and there's like this mass behind it which i'm assuming is like the tail maybe uh or it could be really just about anything but it looks like it's the tail and it's very like fleshy here it's got like this ribbed like ropey flesh these long uh hooked arms and what looks to be the actual eggs of the slivers themselves up here in the head, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, but I wanted to do something very different. Uh, I wanted it to feel more grotesque than this, if you can believe that. So I wanted to add in some very like human elements that would not only make it different, but you know, when you can see something like, it's like a chicken with teeth. I use that analogy a lot. A chicken that had human teeth would be horrifying even though it's just a chicken and it has teeth. Uh, in this case here, that's kind of like the similar feeling that I want to get out of this is that it's very much not a human, but it has just enough of a human quality to it that it becomes far more grotesque. Um, and of course, I'm drawing a lot of inspiration from Alien and the works of H.R. Giger. Uh, and then I'm also drawing some inspiration from uh, creatures in the wild, like little uh, arms here that we saw on the um on the original like it has like little spiked arms on the side i've uh changed for more like a centipede style legged arm thing but i want to keep them a little bit more finger like so those will get look a little bit more like fingers uh, not explicitly so but certainly enough to invoke that feeling as we go and um, the even the arms, they kind of start off very human, and then they even have like little hands on the end, but then they eventually go to that hook as they come to the end. So uh, in the face, there's actually a face underneath the, the, the hood on there. So again, it, it, it's going to look very human, uh, but then also nothing at all human to ho hopefully invoke that feeling of uh, grotesque horror. Um, so one of the things that I did is I looked up, uh, to make this job a little bit easier, I looked up, uh, different like women faces, like women from below <laughs> is what I searched for. Uh, I'm so glad that the, <laughs> the search result was not worse. Um, but I have like this woman's face here that I used. Um, I looked up some different insects and some different other artists work. And like that's the face I chose and the the body is right now it's a little bit more solid it's a little bit more more like a fleshy like a tongue almost uh, but I'm not sure if that's gonna be the final design of it I'm, I'm not sure if I'm quite satisfied with that I may need to make it a little bit more ropey like the original one uh, we'll see as it goes but uh, to get some of these details uh, edge control is the name of the game it's certainly something that I hope that I get better at and you know hopefully it's something that you value as well uh, so when you're looking at it zoomed out everything looks you know pretty decent 
I mean, certainly this would print great on a card. There's some edges, of course, that are more obvious that are loose, but I'm trying to keep a little bit of that translucent uh, look of the egg. Uh, so really, like this is the this area is called out pretty strongly at the moment, and some of these like looser interior definitions are uh, needing to be touched up uh, sooner than later. But uh, we're, I'm slowly getting to that. So, um, and I have just just so you know. I have things on different layers, so the eggs and the queen themselves are on a separate layer. Even the uh, the fog is on different layers, and then of course the background is itself. Let me get rid of the previous stuff. The background itself is on its own separate layer, uh, just to make sure that uh, I have a little bit more control, especially because more and more employers and uh, clients these days are asking for things to be on separate layers. So there can be some parallax or, you know, the assets can be used in other ways instead of just the one painting. So I'm trying to, I'm trying my best to keep that as a best practice to, to do more layer separation. So at any rate, um, to, to get that kind of edge control I want. So like to get the, these things a little bit more, more, fingery. If I, if, I, if I zoom in, you can start to see where the brush strokes become far more uh, apparent and, and loose as they get in closer. I may even want to change up my brush to the um, pressure round. And I can start to come in here and uh, reinforce my brush strokes and uh, start to really build up the rendering and the quality of those fine details. And while, again, from zoomed out, you may not really notice them individually, it's when you put them all together that you get that harmony that really makes the piece start to look clean and refined the way that you envision it. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with a very loose painterly style. Heck, you can look at my portfolio and see plenty that uh, embodies that clean or that rough, loose painterly style. Uh, but sometimes when there's a piece that can, you can go that little bit of that extra mile and, and, and do something a little bit more tight in the, in the uh, rendering, it, it could be worth exploring. And even though like my line work isn't what I think I would be known for, uh, if I was known for anything. Um, just sometimes doing the contrasts and getting like the layers built up, that can sometimes be all the rendering you need. Uh, and, and it certainly does not pay to over-render anything. Uh, know, know your piece, know, know what it needs to say, know what it needs to express. Uh, and if you're not sure, you know, test, figure it out. You know, learn, learn to, learn to, learn to find your limitation in your work. I'll switch back over to the, uh, the common chalk brush. And uh, all of these brushes are available uh, for free through my, uh, my Gumroad, along with my book. I have a free ebook that outlines like what my processes are like. So, ten tips to be a better fantasy. Illustrator overnight. It's all stuff that you can do right away to be better. Um, not to say that my method is necessarily better, but they're little things that if you haven't thought about for improving your processes, um, they could really be helpful. I know they were for me. So like little things like right here, like this right here is a great, this finger right here is a great example. We're going to zoom in 200%. So we can see like here, we got a lost edge here, the completely lost edge here. Um, so what we want to do is we want to make sure that our contrasts are speaking to the edge definition that we want. And really what I'm looking at is there's kind of a mess right here, right? And this is, so now we're following the, the trail back. It's kind of a mess. So like that arm doesn't get well defined all the way through. There's no continuity there. So we'll do that. We'll kind of. And it's okay to have some like loose edges and things like that. It's actually a good idea to balance a strong edge against a weaker edge, something that's a little bit softer. And that, that way the eye doesn't 
feel like it's straining to look at what it needs to look at. Uh, you'll have a side that's very well refined and that, that'll be the edge and then the other side will be much softer. So, but right here, just like balancing out these contrasts between the back, which this is gonna be the tail. I haven't even really figured all that out yet either. Um, and there's the under flesh of the tail. But just figuring this little portion out right here probably will make this the the finger to look a lot more it's like there's some purple that's bleeding through here we don't want um, but this will probably help it look a lot more readable and now there's a continuity from the the side of that that wall of flesh make sure that uh, see we got some brush strokes out here just floating off in the space but yeah it'll um it'll keep that continuity and the more you can describe see like already like look how much cleaner that is just just from that and there's still a big mess of um still a big mess ooh, of color and contrast up here So we can kind of work to build all of that. Right there. But yeah, we can do all of those like such and we can start to kind of get a better idea of the, the face. Is it like already like that looks, you can see the arm coming down uh, you can already imagine it going back up into the, the body as as we've told our viewer. We've shown them right here exactly what, what to expect. So this arm coming out is not weird. It's not It doesn't feel like it's coming out of the, the hip or the snaky part. We've already explained to them. Now what I might want to do is probably change the angle of this. This feels a little low. Even though the shoulder is dipping down, it does feel a little low. So I may want to change the angle of attack there which might make me want to change um, the way this tail is whipping around. But again, that's a detail I can address here in a few minutes. But um, but yeah, that's those are the kind of details that I think they matter. They make a they make a real difference in how, how your image gets read. And readability is just about everything. <clears throat> it's even more important than the quality of the render itself, I think, in most cases, because I can render this to the cows come home. But if it doesn't read good, like this is going to be on a card, if it doesn't read good at small size, it doesn't really matter, does it? So here it looks pretty sharp, zoomed out at that printed size. Um, and... Uh, you know, when we zoom in, it's only when we get real close do we see the flaws and the faults. So for the intents and purposes of this here, uh, that that fine rendering is, is really not that critical. Uh, I want it, <laughs> but, but I don't want to sacrifice the quality of the piece to get it. But yeah, I think what I'll do is, and I'll show you guys here how I would fix this to make it. So if that, if that arm is starting the arm is starting this, so here would be like the separate, like the secondary shoulder setup. So the arm would be starting here, it comes down low. It would probably be more like that, not down that low. So what I need to do is fix this, right? So let's do that real quick. Uh, I'm like, hey, let's just repaint a whole part of the body and do it real quick. It's really not that hard. It really isn't that hard, especially because, again, I figured out all of the design language so really at this point, it's more of a matter of just moving some pixels over. There's a lot of different ways you could do this, but for me, I think it's just as fast and probably less problematic to just paint out um, what I don't want. It will change the attitude of the wrist a little bit. Or it'll kind of twist a little bit more, but again, I can just paint that out pretty easily. Other artists might do something like masking this out and doing like edge looping or something like that. But for me, 
considering how small of an area this is going to be, I just don't think that there's really a need to, to get that frantic with it, especially because this isn't like super late in the game. If this was much later in the game, like if I had already done a ton of rendering and then realized, oops, like I goofed, uh, then I might get a little bit more meticulous about how I move those pixels over. But given where we're at, I just don't think that there's there's precisely a need for it. Like I don't mind if these pixels bump over and overlap some of those fingers because I can just paint them back in because I'm still I'm still rendering them, right? So just doing that little bit right there, I'm gonna grab one of these golds over here. This really helps to make that the planes of the arm appear vastly different because I still want to imagine it as like a cylindrical shape right so like the plane here is not completely underneath it it's on the side of it so there's still gonna be a little bit of light uh, caressing the side of that because remember it's more cylindrical than it is a square or um, you know a flat so it's definitely not a flat surface um, so just doing that right there I've moved the arm and I feel better about the placement of it there. Um, I think it flows a lot better too, instead of it popping out from the bottom there. So I just feel a whole lot happier about moving it there. And then I can just render it in as I go. And yeah, but that's how I kind of fix those mistakes. It's kind of how I render things out. Uh, I'm very, f uh, I, it may be considered a, a, a less efficient method, but I'm kind of frenetic about how I bounce around and render things. Um, I do it just to, just to keep interested in what I'm doing, but I'll do that. I'll like do this arm and then I'll kind of move over here and do this and then maybe back over to the face for a little bit. Uh, it's probably not as efficient to do it that way, but sometimes it's helpful for me to just like stay in the moment, stay interested in, um, in what I'm doing because I, I, <laughs> I, I just kind of ADD like that. Um, <laughs> I definitely have a defi uh, deficit of uh, attention. I did as a kid too. And it made staying on task and staying focused on things kind of hard. And as an adult, it's gotten better, but um, there's still moments like this where it's like, I can definitely feel in my work where my attention will just break and I'll just bounce all over. Like already I'm doing like these, doing these fingers over here. Um, and I would recommend that when you're doing things like these fingers and whatnot, like until you get to the final, final details, try to not overcomplicate these shapes. Like think about the planes of the finger a ton, you know, cause the finger is kinda, it's, it's, it is cylindrical, but I, I, I really think of it more as like a, as a, like a, a box. Because it kind of operates a little bit more boxy. So just try to keep those shapes simple and only really start to render them out when it's necessary. Um, I think these like simple strokes, again, when you zoom out, like that really, that, that does all the work you need it to do without overcomplicating the work. And then you can find like we're here, like where the little knuckle joints and bends are. Like that's where you can really start to develop up your your rendering but you don't have to do that until like really the end i guess or towards the end and you really only want to render out you don't want to render out every little detail you're not trying to put fingerprints on it <laughs> so you know keep it keep it simple until it's necessary for you to start to describe those features because think of it like you're telling a story right you're you're trying to describe visually what it is they should be seeing because obviously like this isn't a photograph right so a photograph is very explicit it sees what the light sees exactly you're capturing something that exists or for the most part exists um and it's it's not a whole lot of storytelling as much um abstractly whereas with the painting no matter what even if you're getting to like photorealism 
uh, there's still a level of, of abstract quality to storytelling visually because of color choices, because of how you chose to bring the light in. Like in this case here, like I really wanted to capture like this feeling of like the volume of light coming through the um, the cracks and through the some foggy mist and things like that. So where where I chose to accentuate that lighting scheme is going to tell a lot of how this works. Like even like the warm color coming off of the eggs, you see the oranges here like on the tip of the um this the the blade and then like how these get a lot warmer and more orange down in here. All of those little choices are going to tell the story for the viewer even if they don't realize that that's what they're seeing because people aren't dumb <laughs> like their brains will figure it out for them and tell them the story so the more you can make it accessible the more you can make it where the the telling of the story says something in a clear and concise way the simpler and more direct you can make it uh, the easier that your image will read and therefore like people will get it even if they don't like it that's not the point but will they get it will they understand what they're seeing and be able to tell others about it um and then at that point they're like you know what they say is not nearly as important because you know some people are gonna like it some people are not um but can they tell the story uh, to me you know people's opinion is going to be what it's going to be but can they formulate an opinion off of your work because if they can't then it just becomes forgettable and i think that's that it, to me that's the only part that really like super hurts I, if you don't like my work that's fine there's plenty of works i don't like so i can kind of relate to that um but uh if you don't remember it at all it just it doesn't evoke any kind of thought process whatsoever like that's where that's when it ouch <laughs> so um yeah so work work to um work to that end you know for better or for worse uh work to make your 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 piece more memorable something that uh, uh invokes a feeling a thought you know it's very um very strong in that way and that's that's how you know you're doing your job but anyway i, I kind of went off on a tangent but that's kind of what i've been doing with the sliver queen uh, i wanted to share share with you guys where i was at with this show you some of the processes that i do so you can kind of get a, a behind the scenes look at um, what it's like to do these paintings sometimes i do this stuff off of stream but uh, i also do them on stream twitch.tv slash dave holland art of course you guys know about that and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys on stream so you can see what I do. And uh, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to uh, do the YouTube thing, the subscribe, hit splaunch the bell. <laughs> I don't I don't know what kids say anymore about the bell, but hit the bell, I guess, or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, don't forget to comment as well because YouTube loves the comments. What your favorite uh, pancake topping in the comments. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.